and the social Okay, greetings, y'all. I'm not sure what happened. I was trying to get in the room earlier. Let's see, who's our moderator? Okay, you're on mute. Let me make you all co-hosts. Amira, you're... Uh... And then Brother Costco is speaking, and Adam. Hello. Can y'all, yeah, come off me. Let's check sound and, um, and Eric, your tech support? Yep. Okay. All right, everybody has their PowerPoints and stuff. Amira, you have the slides? to introduce the session. Oh, is this being recorded? Let me pause the recording. Okay. Well, greetings and welcome to the 2022 seventh annual Black Sustainability Summit. My name is Amira Ali. I'm a sophomore health science major from Orlando, Florida, and I attend Spelman College. I'm also one of the membership engagement and outreach interns, but today I will be your moderator for the session on alternative and renewable energy with Adam Powers and Costco Jones. As you all join the call, we'd love to know who's in the room, so please feel free to drop your name and location in the chat. You should all have access to our social site on Mighty Networks. If not, I will drop the link in the chat at the end so you can continue to discuss with us and make connections once our summit concludes. There's a lot of wisdom in this session and we encourage questions and knowledge exchange. However, for the sake of time and respect for the following session, please use the chat on Zoom to submit your questions or raise your hand. If time permits, we'll open the floor for you and unmute your mic if you request during the last 15 minutes of the session. Thank you again for joining us as we work towards sovereignty by taking the first steps towards self-sufficiency. All of our presenters are doing solid work. Their affiliation with our summit is due to our alignment with their goals and mission. The presentations provided at our summit does not constitute an endorsement of speaker views, products, or services. This session is being recorded, so please make sure once again that your mic is muted until you have a question and are asked to unmute. Today, we'll have the pleasure from hearing and learning from Adam Powers and Costco Jones. Adam Powers is a founder of the nonprofit organization Key Tech Labs and the independent virtual production company Key Studios. And Costco Jones is the owner of Jones Sustainable Solutions Group. Jones Sustainable Solutions Group is a sustainable lifestyle consulting and coaching company specializing in res residential energy efficiency. Jones products inspections and assessments on homes and light commercial properties from an energy and building performance perspective. Today, we hope to walk away learning about the solar microgrid and how it can produce food, water, and energy on the same plot of land, and also learn about solar energy, rainwater, harvesting, vertical gardening, and other green processes that can be used in their homes and on their land. So once again, I would like to thank the presenters for their time, and you all may start sharing your screen. So let me stop. And can you hear me? Okay, so I have a lot to go through and I know there's a limited amount of time. So I am going to be pretty quick with it. As long as my computer is letting me share my screen.
Okay, so technical difficulties going on right now. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Let's go to the top. Okay, so thank you for holding in while I give this uh, presentation. I'm going to move fast because I know I have a limited amount of time, but thank you. I wanted to introduce you to my presentation, which is titled Solar Punk and How We Can Save the World. My name is Adam Powers. I run my own nonprofit, but I'm also part of BOSS, Black Owners of Solar Services, which is a national organization of Black owners of energy distribution. And then I run my own nonprofit called Key Tech Labs, where our mission is to bring emerging technologies to underprivileged areas to help create self-sustainable communities. What does that mean and what does it look like? It looks like the FarmBot. The FarmBot's an open source CNC agricultural robot that when you put on a bed, it will weed, water, and seed the garden all by itself. And this is a device that you can get just online and it's an open source product. And here's just a little video. I'm not gonna play too much of it, but you can see the farm bot operating in real time. And that's its seating. It can switch out heads and water. And that's kind of what I'll we'll be going over is introducing some of this futuristic technology because it's present today, um, going over what solar punk is and the terminology and then talking about renewable energy as well as air to water generation biogas digestion and what we can do as a community to bring these resources not just to your land but to the community as a whole so this video is not going to play audio but solar punk is just this concept of the future the near future where we're using practical technology all together to create an environment where people, technology, culture, um, and all work together. And what we're seeing here is a commercial for uh, a product, it's a yogurt company, and it's a beautiful example of what solar punk is. And when we see the background with the technology mixed with the environment, um, but all of these technologies of the future are here. We have solar energy, so we can generate and store energy right now. We have air to water generation, which we'll talk about, of us generating water from the air. Biogas, which is also known as anaerobic digestion, which can be uh, create a form of heat through methane creation. And vertical gardening, where we can garden in a 10 square foot space, vertically nine feet up and generate 30 heads of lettuce in that um, small amount of space. And you've probably already seen a solar punk film. It's called Black Panther. And if you recall the movie, the way they use technology is different. They're not getting oil from Russia and importing or exporting it in. Their whole city is built directly into the mountain. And they have technology blended into their clothing and into their culture. So that's the best and perfect image of what solar punk is and what could it look like in the future is an actual Wakanda where we're using all this technology together. And that's the image of Wakanda is the definition of solar punk. But why am I talking about superheroes in a presentation about what we can do to save ourselves and the world? It's because we have real life superheroes every single day who are already on this mission. Some of them might be you, my colleague who's speaking today and the other members of this Black Sustainable Summit. All of them are leading the industry and paving a way, just like George Washington Carver, Madam C.J. Walker, Brooker T. Washington. These are the legends and the heroes of our past leading and creating the opportunities for us today but they're also present day heroes like Moses West, who I always have to talk about, who's currently in uh, Mississippi. And he put down a large scale air to water generator that generates 2000 liters of water that he created down in Flint, Michigan, because they still don't have water. He put one down in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, and he's in Mississippi right now helping with the water crisis. Also Shalonda Baker, who wrote Revolutionary Power, a book that talks about everything we're talking about, how we can bring power to everyone, and especially those without power, 
and help make a transition in our world towards a better place. And she also really outlined the intersectionality of social and environmental justice and how if we're truly trying to solve these environmental issues we're facing, then we have to address the root causes, which are social injustices. And this one fact is really what I'm doing this presentation about. The simple fact that may change everything, especially about renewable energy, is in a single hour, the amount of power from the sun that strikes the earth is more than the entire world consumes in a year. That means we generate all the energy we need. And through solar panels, we can generate that energy and store it. And I'm not going to play these videos because I know we have another present, present, ten, present ugh, I cannot even speak right now. Another presentation to go. But this he is- We the... gift, gifted you some more time if you want to. You oh, okay. Put it in the chat. Okay, perfect. You're saying that it's okay to, uh, I think I will play this video yeah. then. Take your time, brother. Okay. Um, I don't know if that audio is. Can everybody hear that? I think you had to click the share, share your sound when you click share screen for us to hear. Okay. So give me just a sec. Let's stop sharing. Well, I do not want to get too much into the technical weeds at the moment. So we will not play the video, but I can drop them in the chat later. So anybody who is interested can um, view them at your own pleasure. The video just goes over how solar energy works. If you aren't familiar, when light hits the panels, the panels convert that light into electricity, into direct current, and then that runs into an inverter which goes and converts that energy into AC, alternating current. That's the type of energy we actually use with all of our devices, including our computers. Um, so now that we have that energy, if you store that energy in batteries, you can either send that energy back into the grid, which there's something called net metering where you can get paid for it uh, based off the energy that you're generating. So you have your own little power station, or you can just use that energy for yourself. And what we'll be going over a little bit is a energy product or a project that we did. Um, this next phase is talking about air to water generation. And if you've ever had a dehumidifier, which captures moisture out the air and puts it into a bucket, then you've generated water from the air. An air to water generator takes it through a couple of more steps. Once it's captured the water, it filters that water through UV filters and charcoal, uh, charcoal filters and UV light, making it drinkable. This is Moses West. He's out in Texas and he's created a large scale air to water generator that generates 2000 liters of water a day. Please look him up at uh, Moses West Foundation. There's also a concept called anaerobic digestion and anaerobic digestion takes waste, animal and food waste, we put it into a um, artificial, basically, it's a cow stomach that has multiple layers. When the food digests and breaks down, it releases methane. Methane is a form of gas that we use to uh, heat up our homes. It's natural gas is mostly methane. So we can create our own heat source and our own energy source because we can also burn uh, methane to run um, biogas generators. So we can create electricity and we can create heat just by taking our waste and putting it into an anaerobic digester versus just putting it into a landfill, which if you know, landfills are just leaking methane into the air. Then there's vertical gardening, which is the aspect of growing vertically. And I'm gonna still have this on mute, but it's a little easier when you can see an image. So, Instead of growing horizontal, horizontally or traditionally, like a standard farm that you would have outside on the farm bed, this is growing up. And there's a water tank at the bottom and a pump that just pumps the water up 
it drops down and whatever the plants, their roots can grab, you it uses. And whatever it doesn't, it recycles. So it uses 90% less water. This is just a product that I found online. You can buy everything, a version of everything that we've talked about so far on Amazon. So the technology exists and people are already using it. It's how we use it. And once we are growing our own food, once we're doing uh, those different things, we can start uh, providing energy and food to our communities through community supported agriculture, which if you ever uh, get a box of food delivered to you that's from a local farm, that's community supported agriculture. We also have a concept of community solar where if you don't have a roof, you can still have the energy of the sun benefiting you and even taking off your electricity bill. So individuals put down large solar arrays, solar farms, and they offer small amounts of panels. So out of this, let's say 500 solar panels makes up this farm. I might be able to buy 10. Everybody on this call buys 10. And we're all owners of partially of this whole energy system. And the energy that my panels generate, uh, in certain states this is allowed and they're trying to make it uh, in all 50 states. The energy being generated off my 10 panels on this land will come off my energy bill. And if I had 200, I would actually potentially be making a profit off of the energy generated. And this is what we're doing. I'm not just talking about it. This is a picture of a garden in Washington where Sphere Solar, a black owned solar company and a boss member put down a microgrid and energized the farm that I'm on the board of. And we threw a huge party in the park called the Solar Punk Festival, where we invited the community to come down and see what we could do with our own energy. And we had vendors out there, we had communities, we had a DJ, we're showcasing the solar system. We were obviously sharing some of the food from the garden and had a caterer. We even had the air to water generator, a small version out there. So we were generating food, water, and electricity on a piece of land completely off grid in about a 600 square foot space. And we've been working with a team of experts from construction to agroecology, to vertical gardening, to Moses West himself. Um, Edwin Wajin, who is the owner of Sphere Solar. And this whole team has been building that little spot and showing that as a demo site. But the next step is we're working with a black farmer out on Whidbey Island here in Washington, who's starting an agroecology farm. She just got a 99 year contract for 10 acres of land. And the objective is to turn it into a multi-use piece of land growing food, but we already plan on putting solar, water, and all of these things that we just talked about. And that first phase would be putting down that large scale uh, solar system in grid so that we have a micro solar system on the land supporting all the energy needs. And then by Moses West machine, or his smallest goes from 75 to 95, and we will be able to generate all the water that we're using uh, on the land sustainably. Then print 3D printed houses, which not only allows us to do it faster, but cheaper and create sustainable, long lasting uh, housing on the land as well. So that we have students living and working on there, as well as the vertical farm, where we would be growing uh, food on the land, obviously horizontally and traditionally, but vertically as well. And a two acre vertical farm can produce the equivalent of a 750 acre horizontal farm. Two acres produces the same amount as 750 acres. So that's why it's important to start bringing this uh, way of growing to everyone. And then finally, we would also build out a studio because it's not just important to create resources. We know digital content, especially educational content, needs to start coming from communities who can tell their own stories. So with all the energy on the land, housing, food, and everything, we can also create digital products that can be sold uh, throughout the world. And each one of these phases has its own revenue stream um, from the solar generating more than the land needs, we can sell it back, including water, housing, 
vertical gardening, extra food can be sold to local communities. Um, and we've been working on a model to really bring this all together because this idea doesn't have to go down on Whidbey Island. It can go down anywhere because the fundamental technology works everywhere. Humidity changes the factor of how much water you can generate and the amount of sunlight that's hitting the land are the only variabilities, really. But we're not just producing opportunities for revenue like we talked about. We're producing products like 30 milliwatts, uh, uh, megawatts of power, uh, 24,000 gallons of water. So that's what this land will be able to produce when we develop it. And we would be working on making sure we are distributing the resources from our central land piece to what we're calling impact farms, which are just small urban farms like Sharks Garden, where I do the solar punk festival, which are strategically placed within communities that need them. So erasing food deserts, because not only are we growing food in our community, we also are using that farms and those urban farms as distribution sites for water, electricity, food, and hosting farmers markets, making food and those resources for living more accessible to everybody. Delivering those to the farmers markets, our community members can exchange that uh, for money or we're even working on a crypto uh, or delivery direct to the house like a CSA program. But if we're delivering water, that's a community supported water program where we can deliver water and those clean resources for living, including heat through community supported biogas as propane tanks so that in emergencies, we are able to provide those resources for our community. And first step is we're gonna empower this big piece of land in Whidbey Island, but this can go in Mississippi, which I have a friend out there who wants to do it as well. We could also take this exact same model and put it down in Ghana. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for spending all the time with me. If you're in Washington or stopping by, I recommend you to come out, see the land, see this microgrid working. Um, we do have a fundraiser. We're raising funds for the second part of the system to empower all of the land. And this is how we bring power to the people. So uh, make contact with me. I will drop my uh, email in the chat and thank you for giving me the time. Thank you, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. We will now be hearing from our next presenter. Oh man, that's a lot to follow. Um, <laughs> I'm Costco Jones, uh, let me share my screen. And I'm just gonna, uh, I'm actually gonna dive into uh, a presentation that I had. It's more so like an energy one-on-one because uh, Brother Adam, he was speaking to a lot of the a lot of the forward thinking blue sky solutions but for the most part people just don't even really understand the basic concept of energy and you know dealing with energy efficiency and energy efficiency is typically the first step that you want to take before you start dealing in solar because you want to reduce how much energy that you're consuming so that the, you get the most bang for your buck with your solar so i'm going to dive into uh dive into a quick little presentation that i have here kind of go from there. Can everybody see my screen? And excuse me, I'm a little under the weather right now. Too. Yes. It's a uh, energy one-on-one sustainability, energy burden, energy solutions. So I'm going to dive into this. It's a little Atlanta centric uh, a presentation I did with a partnership with Southern Equity back. It's a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm from Virginia, I went to Norfolk State, which is an HBCU for undergrad, Virginia Tech for grad school. I've been in Atlanta since 2009. I had a short stint in um, Charleston, but I came back to the conservative there. But let's go to uh, define sustainability. This was something that I did again for the uh, for uh, the partnership with Southern Equity, kind of when this Justice 40, Justice 40 money was uh, first starting to come out. Um, I like to use this model for sustainability because sustainability is actually the sweet spot between you know society, everything that's going on in your, in your normal life, uh, 
uh, the economics and the environment. So that's why I kind of, that's how my definition that I like to use for sustainability, because when, when you start to dive into it more, it's, you know, it's over 300 different definitions for sustainability. So I like to kind of use this model as the one that I like to build off of when I'm kind of explaining what's going on, dealing with sustainability, uh, green building, alternative energy, energy efficiency, all those things like that. So energy burden, what is energy burden? Energy burden is when you're spending, uh, you know, more than 6% of your monthly income on your utility bills. So here's an example of what's going on with that. Uh, you know, I, I basically show someone making about $850 a week. Um, and then, you know, they have $225 worth of utility bills, which is fairly common. A lot of people don't even know that they're in energy burden. Um, and so just dealing with dealing with that and just making people aware of, you no, know, there is a problem looming. Yes, you are dealing with it. It's fairly common, especially in Atlanta. I want to say that we're number uh, three or four in energy burden in the country, um, as far as major cities go. Um, and it gets a little bit worse when you, when, you, when you go out into like more rural areas that, um, you know, that aren't serviced as much as, as much as we are. So when you're dealing with Atlanta, you're dealing with uh, these top these top uh, zip codes over here are the most energy burdened zip codes in Atlanta. Um, I know everyone is not from Atlanta, so just speaking of that, these a lot of these places now are starting to somewhat be gentrified. Um, however, uh, all of the all of the legacy residents residents there are pretty much in energy burden and dealing with that. Whereas other people are coming in and, you know, as they're gentrifying, they're building things, new construction. So they're somewhat mitigating the energy burden for the, for their newer homes. But all of the people that have already been there are still dealing with that. And then they're also dealing with, uh, you know, the, the increase in the taxes and things of that nature because of the gentrification of the area. So here, this is a table kind of just speaking to... Um, what I was saying as far as with the energy burden and, and where Atlanta is as far as one of the major cities here, but some other things that you can kind of glean from what's going on and you look at this here, let's say these top four cities right here, these were all places where redlining happens. So there are other, there are other studies that show out to show how, you know, systemic this has been for so long because uh, you can just literally direct correlations between um, redlining and energy burden if you go back and look at those maps and look at what's going on now. Uh, let's see here. Then look, this is just kind of just talking about utilities and you know what we're dealing with here in Georgia. It's not you know as liberal like over there in Washington where Adam is and, and you know uh, where we can kind of just set up our solar how we want to and, and, and do those things. That's not how Southern Company, that's not how Georgia Power is letting things work here. We actually just had another rate increase happen, <laughs> happen, uh, you know, in the midst of all of this that's going on right now. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a different type of uh, older money over here that, that we're dealing with in, in the Southeast and within the Bible Belt and everything like that. That is, uh, that is um, pretty much the big bad wolf, um, so to speak. This is uh, just some, some statistics behind Georgia Power and, um, you know, some of, the, some of the money that they made and, and just, just kind of showing that, you know, they can afford to do better by us if they wanted to, um, you know, but it's, it's not something that happens. Uh, as you can see, you know, they have a, a fairly high dividend payout. So a lot of, a, a lot of people, especially in this state that, that um, complain about Georgia Power don't complain about it too much because they also own the stock and they get and they were getting dividend payouts from Georgia Power stock, which is you know another another something that kind of goes under the radar. And you know uh, our people we're typically not as uh, as 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 educated in you know understanding the the power of passive income and owning stocks and dividends and things of that nature. So that's not something that. I would, I, would, uh, I would glean that a lot of us were getting those benefits. Let's 
so this is boom just speaking of what I was just talking about uh, when when I made this presentation it, it was a it was a few years ago when we were we were back in these areas now we're here in 2022 the rate increase just happened and everyone's putting the squeeze on top of you know everything else is going on with inflation it's it's, it's a really terrible time just as far as what's what's going on here in the, in the state of Georgia with uh, Georgia Power and also you know we're still paying for the, the plant and all of the things of that nature but all of these things that we were talking about even when we're dealing with energy efficiency um, when, when you speak on the energy efficiency and the energy burden and things of that nature that's kind of on the micro level dealing with the individual um, from the macro level, looking at it from a large picture, the utilities, they really care about this right here, peak energy during the summertime when everybody's in the house is super hot and, and the AC is on. They have certain tiers and certain levels where if the demand gets to a certain point, they have to, they have to uh, step up their, their energy productivity to make sure that they can, um, to make sure that they can uh, take care of the demand that's going to be being put on the grid. That's why, uh, you know, what Brother Adam was talking about, the, the micro grids and getting the micro grids established and things of that nature, that kind of helped to reduce that peak energy load. And, and that's something that, um, that's something that utilities, that's pretty much one of the better ways to try to get, your, get, the, sol get the solar through, is talking about reducing peak loads because that's, that's typically what they're worried about on their, on their side. Uh, that's my boy right there, Kingston Ali. You know, he's uh, he actually was born deaf, so he has two cochlear implants. And you know, that's part of my energy burden story right there. Is is, is um, just making sure that you know when I'm when I'm dealing with when I'm dealing with him, you know, he has everything that he that he needs. Uh, just from that perspective of, if, you know, if the power's out, then you know. Uh, he may not be able to charge his implants, and then you know we have to go to straight ASL, and he can he you know he's being robbed of his hearing just you know for the simple fact that you know it's 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 an energy it's an energy problem. So that's definitely one of my things. I'm sure other people have different stories of energy burden, maybe boiling water to take a bath, different things of that nature um, coming up. Um, I personally, one of my certifications that I hold, I'm a ResNet HERS rater. This is a career path that I like to push when I go out into communities and, and, and speak with people um, about potential career paths. You don't have to go to college to be a ResNet um, HERS rater, although I, I do have three degrees. Um, you can you can simply take courses of that. So this is one of the one of the kind of green jobs training paths that I that I'm um, working to get established and um, basically affect the market. Um, to the point where someone has to have one of these and any time a real estate transaction happens, they have to get a HERS rating, which is like a working document for your home that's showing how much energy your home is consuming. So uh, again, this just kind of speaking to uh, what's been going on with HERS rating, the diffusion of it. Um, you know the average the average score for a hers rating was a fifty eight. Come again? Somebody has to. Okay. Um. So when you're speaking when you're speaking uh, on hers ratings, it kind of goes from a zero to a hundred score. So when you hear people talk about net zero homes, they're actually talking about a net zero hers score. So what you would typically see happen is you would get the hers rating somewhere to about like a 30 or something like that. And then once you install the solar panels, the solar panels will offset the rest of the energy consumption in order to get the, the, the hers rating down to a net zero. Um, your typical your typical home um, built prior to uh, 90 is 130, but I say what 130 is a, a well-kept home. Typically, these homes that you see that are rental income properties um, that you see and that, that I've seen around Metro Atlanta, they're usually somewhere about a 150 to 160. So, and what that what's that saying is that someone is spending an extra 50 to 60 percent on their utility bills um, as opposed to a home that was built uh, that was built to uh, 
you know, the code more recently on new construction homes and things of that nature. Uh, obviously your energy efficiency and things of that nature, they somewhat tie into the value of your home and people want homes that are more energy efficient when they buy homes, but the brag is still, you know, decor, oh, granite countertops, this, that, and the third. And that's part of the narrative that we need to start trying to change as a, as a people. I think it's very important for us to kind of understand, that, you know, uh, your operating cost of your home and being an energy burden, this is one of the one of the sneakiest, probably most quiet uh, stillers of our generational wealth, and something that works against us because you know you're spending that extra money on your bills, whereas someone that's in a more energy efficient home could be spending that extra money, you know, acquiring these these dividend stocks that we were just talking about, or making other investments, buying another buying another. Um, income property and things of that nature but you can't do that if you're in energy burden and you're, and you're spending all that extra money on these things because your home is inefficient that's why we need to be uh, taking way more priority into making sure that we're focusing on energy efficiency and doing uh, doing whatever things that we can do when we're when we're acquiring properties or when we're in our existing homes especially we own them or in, and or even in your apartment building while you're in there, while you're in your specific apartment, there are little quick fixes and things that you can do in order to kind of help with your comfort and your energy efficiency in your specific unit. Or when you're shopping for your apartment, make sure that you move into an apartment that has a green building certification, is it has a lead certification, is it Energy Star, is it all of these things? Because those things are going to help with your comfort and going to help reduce your total overhead as well. So these are things that we need to think about. Um, this is just kind of a slide speaking to uh, consumer demand and, and some of the some of the trends and things that people are looking for um, when they're buying a home. So yeah, it's starting to become energy efficiency. It's starting to become something that that's, that's a factor. But again, like I was saying, the brag is still typically, you know, decor related things as opposed to energy efficiency related things. And then you know. I haven't even really gotten into the soft cost of, you know, people with breathing disorders and things of that nature and how they should prioritize energy efficiency, um, you know, because energy efficiency typically means that your building envelope is tighter and your building envelope um, means that if your building envelope is tighter, that means that you're probably going to have better indoor air quality. So having a better indoor air quality is going to help uh, reduce uh, the triggers for asthma and things of that nature from a breathing perspective. So um, you, you're helping, that's another soft cost that people don't really think about or correlate when they're thinking about energy efficiency and indoor air quality, things of that nature. Just having the, in, a more energy efficient home is typically a healthier home to live in. Too. People are literally will be living in homes that uh, have things going on and triggers that the home is, the home is quietly killing them for lack of better words. Um, another reason that uh, I always explain to people to invest in energy efficiency because everyone's worried about, oh, well, doesn't that stuff cost more on the construction side, more on the construction side? But when you think about the actual phase and the time, is the house being built? Does it take longer for the house to get built? Or are you going to live in that house longer than it took for the house to get built? You're probably going to live in that house longer than the house is being taken to get built. So you want to understand, you know, that you're going to get your return on investment um, in the long run because you're 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 in this home for the for the long run. You're not, you, you know, the, the building is not the building isn't going anywhere once it's built. So spending that little bit of extra money up front uh, is not the end of the world. And I always I always uh. Well, an example I like to give is uh, when I when I was graduating from Virginia Tech, I, just, I, I was just like, oh, man, I'm buying these Gucci's to walk across the stage in because, you know, I was dealing with that trauma of, you know, where I was at and things of that nature. So I wanted to stunt and ball. Um, I paid about $4.50 for a pair of Gucci shoes. I got them Gucci shoes on my feet right now. So, you know, they about 12 years old now. So you take that 450, you divide that by 12. How long, you know, how much did I really pay for those Gucci shoes now? It's, it's, it's just a nice pair of shoes 
exclusive. You can't even buy them in the store anymore. So it's the same thing with a home and putting that money into the home up front because it's going to pay off on the back end. You want to, you want to put the quality in up front as far as the energy efficiency and things of that nature goes. Um, this is just kind of more speaking to uh, how I look at the house. I look at the house as a system. Everything affects one another in the home. So again, like I was saying that, that you know, okay, if the home is tighter than the building envelope, is, if the home is energy efficient, that means the building envelope is probably tighter. Well, if the building envelope is probably tighter, then yes, the indoor air quality could be better, but if you do something in the home that affects the indoor air quality, then that air won't dissipate as fast. So you have to make sure that you have proper ventilation that you can turn on to properly ventilate the home. You also want to make sure that you're cleaning with the right type of cleaning supplies so that you're not setting off things like, you know, people like the, oh, uh, burning fabuloso and the house smell like pine salt and things of that nature. All of those things are called VOC, volatile organic compounds. So you don't want to deal in volatile organic compounds because those are not uh, helping your indoor air quality. They're actually putting cancerous things and pollutants into your air. The house. The house is full of systems. You know, you have your, your drainage systems, foundation, flooring, wall, things of that nature. These are all part of the things that I look at when I'm coming into a home doing an assessment. Some of the things that I typically find, looking at your ductwork. Your ductwork is in the attic. Typically, um, I found plenty of, gone in plenty of homes where I could literally just put my hand in the ductwork. So if I could put my hand in the ductwork, that means that all of that, um, all of that kind of not so good attic air with, uh, you know, if you have the blown in and you have the fiberglass particulates in the air, you can have the dust from, you know, being up there in the attic. Um, if, if it's any type of uh, rodents or things like that, that, that feces and, and things of that nature, all of those things are getting mixed up in your actual HVAC air that's, um, you know, being distributed throughout your home. On top of that air that you're trying to get into your home, you might want that air to be 72 degrees. In the summertime, it might be 130 degrees in the attic. So how much harder is your system working in order to try to get that air down to its target temperature? These are all these are all things that you know I kind of look at and take and take into account, and I want people to kind of be aware of when they when they're in their homes, because you know you your um them bills coming every month, regardless. These are some other be um, best practices that I always uh, kind of prescribe to people when I look for a new construction, and I push for people to do in um, their existing homes. You know, there are programs that you can take advantage of, um, Georgia Power programs, uh, like weatherization um, and, and things of that nature to uh, get these things done and get some type of rebates and things of that nature. And there is and there's definitely some, um, some money about to come down the pipeline for homeowners from the federal level to, to um, help incentivize people to do um, more energy efficient things. So be on the lookout for those things as well. Um, this is just kind of speaking to some of the things that I, I prescribe people to do in the attic. Um, just stopping that airflow from the attic, coming back into the home. There are a lot of more passive things that happen. Um, something else in these, uh, in these older Atlanta homes, a lot of people have the attic fans. I literally have um, a, a glad pressing seal across my whole attic fan in my in, you know in the hallway that it's in um because it's so much air that it's literally like a, a, a interstate for air going back and forth and, it, and it's right there by the actual thermostat so the thermostat will be feeling that air moving from the attic and it's not giving the true temperature of what's going on in the house so it's little quick fixes things of that nature just to kind of help they're going to help with energy but they're also helping with the, with the comfort in the home Back to, back to the building envelope. Dealing with the building envelope is typically one of the biggest bangs for your buck because it's usually just some air sealing that needs to be done, um, some caulking or some foaming, things of that nature. It could be labor intensive, but you know, those cans of foam, those cans of caulk are way cheaper than replacing windows. So um, just looking at things of that, looking at things of that nature from that 
kind of already spoke on these asthma triggers and all of those things that you can find in the home um, and they'll be exacerbated uh, more and more. As you tighten up your home, you have to be more conscious about all of these things and, and um, what's going on with them because they can, they, again, they can be exacerbated when you have your home, when you have your building envelope tighter as you're trying to make your home more energy efficient. And you will notice that um, after you, you know, you get your home weatherized or something, and you, and you get your your air changed per hour in your home reduced from, let's say, fifteen to eight or something like that. Um, your behavior can affect your bills up to fifty percent. You like to go to sleep with the TV on. You leave the TV on when you when you when you um gone from the house. Uh, you know. Uh, Leaving in all your all your small appliances plugged in, your juicer and you know your microwave, your toaster, your toaster oven, your uh, your Keurig, or whatever that thing is that people have, all that stuff like that. These things, um, these things can affect your bills, uh, you know, up to fifty percent if you have bad habits. And then that's something that I see happen a lot too. People move into energy efficient homes, and then they don't. They, they they get more wasteful because they're like, oh, the bills are the bills are supposed to be cheaper anyway. Um on, let me see this. Let me go ahead and get through the rest of this so I can see this next one here. And I was really just speaking on this talking on education and making sure that people understand, you know, how their home uses energy. Um, some of the common things that you use energy on, space heating, space cooling. This is kind of more so speaking to uh, trying to get rid of those VOCs. These are a few recipes for, uh, these are a few recipes for uh, homemade cleaners and things of that nature to, just to try to help you uh, mitigate all of those VOCs in the air, but keep your home clean without using all that without using um, all of those products that you see on the right um this is speaking to light bulbs for the most part people are pretty much into the cfls and the leds now you don't see the um incandescence too much but it's just kind of showing those showing those paybacks on that um this is speaking to modern monetary theory um and that's just kind of saying that we have enough money to pay for these things as a country because any debt that we have that's in US dollars, we can literally just make the money for it and it should be able to go away. Just like we just made all that money to send the Ukraine. Um, this was kind of just speaking to the, the uh, New Green Deal and what was going on with Justice 40, getting back into that. And uh, that's basically it. Thank you, thank you for that lovely presentation. I will start sharing my screen once again. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Okay, perfect. Before I open the floor for questions, I would just like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, um, send our deepest gratitude for our sponsors and our supportive organizations. So that's, it's also hyperlinked. These are some of our sponsors. And at the same time, I would also like to give thanks to our volunteers because this could not have been done without them and they've all volunteered their time. So I'd just like to say a big thank you. Now I saw some questions in the chat. Um, would anyone like to please unmute and ask a question to either one of our participants for today? And if not, no worries. I have a question. Yes. Um, in terms of efficiency, and thank you, uh, brother, for this uh, well put together presentation. It was, you know, one good package. Um, when I, I meant you said something about window efficiency, and I've had people come to my house with all kinds of different types of windows to replace my windows. My house was 115 years old. So I just want to know what your advice is in terms of the type of replacement windows it's a it's the best the best choice I 
guess that question was for me. Um, and those, and with your home being so old, sometimes you might be in like a historical difference where it's actually like um, more hoops that you have to jump through in order to replace your windows because they want them to look a certain type of way um, to not um, to not throw off the architecture of that historic district. Uh, but if you don't, if you don't have that problem, no, then, I don't have, you know, I, do, I don't have that problem. If you, if you don't have that problem, then you can just kind of go with the best windows that you can afford from a, um, a U, a U factor and a solar heat gain coefficient scenario. What, where, where are you? Like what climate are you? I'm that's, in the city. I'm in the city of Decatur, Georgia. Oh, you're in Decatur. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, just um, talk to me offline and we can. I, 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 <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, you have your information in the chat. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, I see ECLC has their hand raised. You can unmute, ask your question if you have one. Yes, uh, good morning. Excellent presentation for both of you, excellent session. I, this uh, question, I put this in the chat, is for Mr. Jones. Um, and it's, it's a really, I think you covered part of my question was in part of our energy efficiency, we reduced air exchange rates and you can get an increase in chemical pollutants, you know, that are, that are emitted in the home. Uh, part of it, you, you did say you can remediate. And I guess the question is, do you recommend using air cleaners, either the portable or induct systems to try to reduce the uh, chemicals and other pollutants uh, in the home? Personally, I, I'm a, um, I'm a fan of, of making sure you have a, a good a good level. You have to make sure you have the proper static pressure and stuff with the system, but going with the best uh, level of MER filter that you can get, typically like a eight or eight or higher. Um, I think I think that's that's huge. And then making sure you have the proper ventilation, not just uh well two ways you can go about it. You can do your intermittent, you know, or you can have it continuous. Uh, continuous may have a little bit more of an energy penalty to it um, as opposed to the intermittent, but making sure you have your, your, your proper uh, ventilation going, your spot ventilation in, in, your, in your places where you're going to need that as well as your, uh, as well as, you know, your, your, just your fresh air being introduced to the home through the, through the actual system. Does that make sense? Like I, I'm, I'm more of a fan of those things, and then I'm also a fan of uh, using using certain house plants to clean the air and create micro and create microclimates, as opposed to. The, and then if you want to look at those houses, those houses are um, those houses. I mean those those house plants. You can just literally Google NASA house plant, and um, it'll be a chart of house plants that pop up and they give you all of their different qualities on how they can clean the air and things of that nature. I see we have another hand raised, so please just feel free to unmute and ask your question. Hi, good day. My name is Freedom and I'm at Freedom in Saroma Liel and I am uh, wanting to know a little bit more about the chart you showed that showed triggers for asthma. Uh, one of the things you had on was exercise and, um, and the other was, well, stress and anger. But since we've been, I don't own the home that I live in right now, but, uh, and since we've been going through COVID, everything is done inside the house. You know, we've just been uh, locked down for everything inside the house. So how would you suggest, um, you know, kind of dealing with those things or changing things around to sort of um, open up the possibilities for healing inside of doing everything inside the house? And even now we're, we're even like doing everything over Zoom. So that has to have some uh, effect on what's happening in, inside the energy inside the house as well. First, I would say get get out the house. You got to get some vitamin D and get in the sun. Um, that's that's definitely one of the one of one of the things that I would say initially is just go you know go outside get some sun. Um, if you're in the house like that, you know just dealing with basic basic stuff. Um, 
look into the feng shui of your home, how the energy is flowing, the vastu. Um, I can't remember the African term for it, but feng shui and vastu, that's, that's kind of, you know, just rearranging things in your home. Uh, I'm an advocate of plants. Uh, plants, mm -hmm. plant, talk to your plants, what are your plants? Um, pick out plants to help, you know, do things, uh, aromatherapy, your lavender, you know, um, you know, burning your sage, your Pio Santo, just things of that nature, like in, in, in my mind. Now, remember when you when you're doing those things, you kind of want to make sure you 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 know you open in a window or something to kind of let that let that initial smoke out or whatnot. But yeah, I, that's that would be my thing. Just kind of you know centering yourself in your space, but you know always making sure you're getting your sunlight. Um, make, maybe rearranging things to make it as functional as possible, or rearranging things every you know maybe ninety days or something like that, just so you're not. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. Thank you, too. Mm -hmm. Can you did hear I, me? Did I, did I answer your question? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I just I also wondered, like, exercising inside the house as we approach winter, does mm -hmm. that have an effect on you? Is it because you're taking in certain, um, certain things when you breathe, you know, um, exercising inside the house? Now, I, I think with the exercising, it's just a matter of you could overdo it. Um, you can overdo it and put too much on your lungs. As, as mm, oh, I see. Yeah, my mother has severe asthma. She literally has a breathing machine. So, um, you know, but all in the same, the other part of that is sometimes you got to push. So we'll go, we'll, we'll try to walk up Stone Mountain every now and again, <laughs> you know, just to, so, you, you know, you got to push because then that's how you build your capacity. So it's, yes. it's, a, it's a thin line between the two. I, I don't know if you're in the Atlanta area or not, but if you are, you know, you can go to 7-9 and they have teas and things for asthma to help with that too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Are there any more questions from the floor? I actually had a question for Brother Adam. Okay. Hey, Brother Adam, um, have you seen, because I, I saw you talking about the, the, the 3D printed homes and, and things of that nature, and I know they typically use concrete. Have you seen any scenarios where people are using the hempcrete um, with the 3D printed homes? Because I'm kind of one of those people that I'm not necessarily an advocate for 3D printed homes because I feel like so many jobs are provided through skilled labor um, for, for, for our people, but, you know, it, the technology is going to diffuse. So, I mean, have you seen people using the um, the hempcrete instead of concrete for it? And do you know what the initial cost of one of those industrial size three D printers are? Uh, first, no. I'm also looking for some three uh, D printer that can use hempcrete. Um, but for the most part, uh, it should be possible. Uh, I just haven't seen anybody activate it yet. And I've been engaged with a couple of different parties. And one of the parties that I who's taking the lead on it was gave me a quote of $75,000 for a 3D printer that could print 200 to 700 square foot tiny houses. Uh, this is concrete though. So to answer the first question, no, I don't have not encountered anything on the market yet that is printing 3D printed houses using hempcrete. And second question is basically the smallest unit uh, that I've been able to find a quote for, even uh, through a third party or uh, was 75 grand. And that could print seven houses in seven days. Thank you. Okay, I actually have a question for both presenters. Um, what do you guys think are the realistic time frames or time scales for converting to 100% renewable energy? You said, what, can you repeat it one more time? Of course. Um, what do you think are the realistic time frames or time scales for conversion to 100% renewable energy? You said realistic? Renewable energy, like realistic time frames. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it just it really depends on how you know what type of monies get put into it and how people lean into it. I mean, you know, you hear all the cities and stuff saying twenty thirty five. 
that's we're not gonna get that. Um, I would probably say maybe 45, 50, realistically speaking. Um, in my mind, and that would also be with people being still being very intentional about it. Um, I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it happening any faster because it's, it's still a little bit of shakeout that needs to happen on um, just people being used to power very high up. Uh, but I, I think we're starting to we're starting to get momentum from the bottom up, and I think that's that's what's helping right now. But it's still going, it's still going, you know, it's going to take time. That's my opinion. Um, I agree in the most optimistic view, 10 years, but the obstacle is not the technology. It is the investment of funds. And um, if we war as a country to start investing into manufacturing of solar panels, then it would change everything. But until those investments on a very large scale for manufacturing of the products, so it's not just most solar panels still come from China, um, then we won't be able to have that. We need to place factories in Ghana, in Mississippi, in Washington. And even with that, it would take about seven years of ramp up before we can start distributing those panels across the world and installing them. Thank you. I believe there's another hand raised. Feel free to unmute. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, this question, uh, one is for uh, Mr. You're muted. I'm sorry, you went out. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, this question is for Mr. Powers. Uh, you, you mentioned vertical farming, and I'm just wondering the costs of that. Let's say if you're looking at, let's say you had a plot of one, five, ten acres, how the cost of startup doing traditional farming methods versus the vertical, is it is cost effective to start that type of farming? Uh, so that would be the first question. And then two, the 3D printing is fascinating. And since we're talking about sustainability, one issue is dealing with um, the issues of climate change. We're seeing more storms. We just recently saw the hurricanes, wildfires, and that the concrete, although I know there's some, some challenges with that, but could now allow us to, to be in areas that are prone to flooding or fires, that the concrete is more, or things like insects and, and other things, that the concrete uh, would be more resistant and uh, would lower cost in a way because you wouldn't have to do the types of repairs after these storms? So yes, on that second part is uh, concrete uh, buildings and dome buildings are uh, tend to hold up a lot better in large environmental uh, disaster areas. Um, and because of the quick nature that you can place one down, we can come into areas that have been devastated and create housing um, very quickly and get people into housing. Uh, that first part was about vertical gardening. It was about what is the initial startup cost versus traditional gardening. Uh, it's going to be relatively the same for the relative same scale. If and both you have to have the land. So excluding the land cost, assuming you already have it, then vertical gardening can be done in very easy and cheap ways. I've 3D printed a vertical tower. So the tower itself is printed at, uh, from reusable and uh, recaptured plastic. So if we were to create vertical gardens out of those uh, plastic towers, then it becomes technically even cheaper. So I, I don't even have to go and buy soil if I'm going to try to capture and get soil. Um, so the law, I get the answer is they have the same relative cost for the same relative space, except when you start scaling vertical gardening, uh, the space to uh, cost ratio actually decreases dramatically because you're 
in 10 square feet, I can grow 30 plants. Well, I need about um, a full standard size garden bed, like eight by 10 to eight by 20 to grow that many, um, unless I'm gonna pack them pretty close. So uh, if you're doing it on an industrial level, the building is the biggest cost. Uh, I actually developed a greenhouse and we can do vertical gardening in a greenhouse. Um, so it really just depends on what scale you're trying to do it, but relatively uh, excluding the land, it's going to have uh, the same cost if you're doing it outside. If you do it inside, obviously there's extra cost. Thank you. I actually have another question for both presenters. Um, what is the most useful scale to think of about alternative energy and does it vary by source? Either one of you guys can take it. So you said useful scale. Yes. Um, I, well, um, that's a difficult question. Right, you can interpret that any way you want to or approach that any way. To address this issue of uh, global climate change and uh, just to address all the issues, we need to attack it from both scales. Uh, large industry level, uh, billions of dollars like the Inflation Reduction Act is doing uh, that needs to happen. But at the same time, we all need to start uh, on the scale we're in. Whether you're in an apartment, you can re reduce your energy use. You can even stick a mini solar panel in your window that just charges your phone. And now when the electricity goes out in your neighborhood, you're still able to charge your phone. Um, so we need to attack it on both scales, the individuals, the families, the communities, and the large scale industrial, governmental, and uh, country scale. Otherwise, it will, it's not going to happen. I would like to speak to, I think we can also lean into uh, kind of leveraging group economics. And um, especially in like more rural areas where you can you can you, it's, it's a little bit more lawless uh, as far as on on the on the solar side of things uh, but i think we also need to have the capacity to produce these things our own so you know i'm so excited when i'm hearing people talk about uh manufacturing because as we as we start to manufacture you know us as a people once we once we start making things we tend to improve upon them so I think improving upon some of these technologies and getting them to the next, getting them to the next level, um, kind of like what uh, China's been doing with the solar film, and getting those solar films and making those solar films a little bit more, uh, a little bit more uh, efficient as far as the amount of uh, electricity that they produce per solar film, because they have more application, um, they they have more applications, uh, but also understanding that it's it's gonna be a mix, right? So we still have other things that we haven't fully dove into, just like harnessing the the power of the of the of the uh, ocean waves and things of that nature, things that are just kind of happening. Like I've seen technologies out there, but making sure we're using all of those things and then just understanding that, you know, solar isn't a silver bullet. It's it's literally depending on where you are. Some places get more wind the wind is more feasible. Some places solar is more feasible. And then remembering that it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be somewhere hot for the solar to work. Solar actually works in cooler, the solar panels work better in cooler climates actually. So that's why, you know, Brother Adams being up there in, in um, Washington, you know, on a, on a sunny day in Washington, that's gonna be better than a sunny day in Arizona. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any more questions from the floor? If they want to um, ask okay. This is Mbacho. I just want to add, um, I am a vertical tower garden distributor, and uh, we found that the tower gardens actually are cheaper than, um, than on the land, and the fact that you can grow your food, uh, 30 plants almost on one tower, one vertical tower long, 
And um, we have many farmers now that are using the vertical towers to grow their food, especially during the winter time when it's harder to grow outside. Um, and then some people are using hoop houses as well with their vertical gardens. And um, I did put my um, information in the chat if people want to get more information. Just a quick question. Can these vertical gardens, can they be used indoors as well as outdoors or indoors only? No, it can be done. You can get what they call a flexible vertical um, uh, tower garden. You can use it inside or outside. And they have LED lights um, that you can put on them inside. And um, I have one on my deck with the LED light that I use um, for my, my garden. And uh, they have testimonials every Saturday evening from 8 to 8.30 p.m. And people all across the country and globe um, do testimonies about their vertical gardens. It's amazing how much can be grown on one vertical garden, let alone 20 of them um, in, the, in a farm area. Or a lot of churches are using them, and daycares are using them, and senior citizens are using them. So it's, it's becoming very popular at this time. Thank you, thank you everyone. If anyone has any more questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. We will um, get them to the presenters. Um, before we move on, I would just like to say, please feel free to join the Black Sustainability Network and for more discussions, I will put the link to the website in the chat so everyone can take a look once this concludes. And that concludes this panel. Our next panel is about leveraging resources within environmental and climate justice with Dr. Holloman Hill and John Moore. Please feel free to go check that out right after this, but thank you everyone for tuning in and I hope you all have a great rest of your day.